So I'll be presenting deep learned reconstruction in the context of nuclear medicine, giving an update on some of the things my team has been doing. So as an overview, I'll cover direct deep learned reconstruction for an intraoperative probe for single photon imaging. Then I'll move on to unrolled deep learned iterative methods for PET reconstruction and synergistic PET MR reconstruction. And then I'll finish with a little bit on clinical image quality assessment using a CNN. So getting on then with the single photon imaging, what we have here is an intraoperative probe composed of basically a CMOS sensor, where what we're trying to do is image the location of this tumor, which has a technetium 99 m labeled compound that's been taken up into that lesion, into that cancer there. And then the idea is the surgeon would scan this around to locate that tumor and then know when all of the tumor has been resected. So this is what typically the CMOS uh, sensor array output would look like. And uh, what would be conventionally done is that each one of these uh, little event clusters would correspond to an electron or a gamma. And normally one would try and um, separate out the electrons from the gammas in order to identify where that lesion is and know whether or not it's been successfully removed. Um, but what we're trying to do here is use a direct deep learned reconstruction to use all the data to reconstruct an image of that radio tracer distribution. So just with simulation to start off with then, there's the Shep Logan Phantom. Here is a simulation of our sensor array output by scanning that intraoperative probe over this radio tracer distribution. And then what we've done is train up a convolutional encoder decoder, very much inspired by the deep pet architecture by Hagstrom et al. And we train this with uh, uh, three or so object types. But what's so exciting here is that we'd be able to, in principle, uh, will be to measure known ground truths where we could, uh, for example, have a technetium 99, technetium 99 M labeled compound, uh, which is also um, an ink or a dye at the same time. So we could do optical imaging and therefore get knowledge of the ground truth um, in order to supervise training of this network. Um, and then the idea would be to, to infer or to reconstruct in real time the radio tracer distribution from that CMOS uh, sensor array output. Um, these are early results just from simulation uh, data where we trained with just a single object type here for Shep Logan phantoms in various configurations, brain web phantoms, random noise, and we get quite good high quality reconstructions. Maybe as expected, when we start testing with objects that weren't in the training set outside the training domain, then we get loss of image quality and so the error goes up. Always very interesting to see how when we train, for example, on random noise, then if we test on a brain web or a Shep Logan phantom, then those objects take on um, the characteristics, if you like, of that random noise manifold. However, if we train with all of the objects uh, simultaneously, all of them used in the training data set, then not only do we actually do pretty well uh, compared to training with individual objects, um, but actually we can even outperform single object training uh, for the case of that Shep Logan Phantom. So here we've, we're suggesting that diversified training manifolds can actually improve upon um, networks that have been trained just on one object type. And in fact, we found something similar with varying the count levels as well. We can nearly do as well um, if we cover all the different count levels, we can nearly do as well as when we've done a dedicated count level training of a network. Also, we've experimented with test time augmentation and here we're showing that by modifying um, the position, uh, rotations, for example, or displacements, uh, what we can do is just uh, modify the input to the convolutional encoder decoder, get uh, an inference for that, if you like, modified input, and then do that for many different modifications of the input. And then we can finally uh, de-augment and average those inferences to get a better quality output from our network. And by doing this, we can effectively reduce the amount of training data um, that are needed to train up that convolutional encoder decoder. So with the use of test time augmentation, uh, we can actually, with only a training of set size of 60, we can outperform a network that had 90 objects included um, when test time augmentation was not used. So that's uh, helping us in terms of reducing training data needs. Uh, moving on to deep learned iterative PET reconstruction. Um, so here then we know with PET, we, uh, for example, uh, collect uh, sinograms, maybe a thousand such sinograms from a MMR scanner, and we're seeking to do 3D reconstructions. Um, one of the core methodologies, of course, or the objective function that we use is the Poisson uh, log likelihood, because we're dealing with uh, Poisson uh, distributed noisy data. 
and we use the well-known expectation maximization algorithm to maximize that Poisson log likelihood with a sequence of iterates that are effectively maximizing a surrogate function, a conditional expectation of the complete data log likelihood. So this very simple algorithm, just forward project ratio, uh, back project multiply, that can just be unrolled into a deep network. And the point is that because we're often dealing with noisy data, uh, when we have um, short scans or reduced um, injected dose, then we end up with uh, noisy images. This is conventionally resolved by using MAP-EM, where we have some prior, which amounts to a penalty function um, for that Poisson log likelihood. And so here I'm showing a simple quadratic prior. And we can uh, go about maximizing this log posterior just by combining a data fidelity based update, that's the EM algorithm, and then use of this uh, denoised version of the current iterate in the sequence of iterates. Um, and this um, is effectively doing a, a surrogate um, optimization problem for this objective here. And we just combine this denoised update uh, with the data fidelity based update in this uh, single update formula. Um, and this can be written as follows, just like, a, like I showed before, just a deep network where any given stage we've got an iterative, um, we've, got an up, we've got an updated uh, reconstructed image, and then that gets denoised or, or also put into the EM update. The two get fused together to get the next update. Uh, we can also extend that to include MR guidance to try and recover um, some of the uh, poor spatial resolution due to the low counts in the PET data. Uh, but of course, this is all very mathematically convenient. Um, we used a quadratic prior here. It's unlikely to be optimal. and We don't even know how much MR guidance to use. And so that's where, of course, we can put deep learning in here. And so what I'm showing here is a representation of about three or so methods in the PET literature, which, um, which can be represented in this following construct, where we take our current um, update, and then we can learn uh, a network um, to denoise that, to provide a fixed image prior for use for use in a MAP-EM update, just like we had that um, intermediate smoothed image in the previous MAP-EM updates that I showed. Uh, now we can uh, find that intermediate image from a deep network. Um, and then we can typically iterate that just once there and get a new update. Now, of course, to train up that network, we're gonna need the high quality reference data. And so we use a much higher count version of the scan data here. So in our training set, we need low count, high count pairs, of course. And uh, so we often use the mean square error loss function and uh, use that to train up uh, the network just by taking the gradient of that and back propagating. So this is FBSCM uh, net uh, published some time back now, uh, which does exactly what I've just been talking about. Here is the explicit architecture and it's seeking to maximize this penalized uh, Poisson log likelihood. So given a current um, iterative um, update here, given image xn, what we do is a gradient descent based on this unknown uh, penalty term because we're no longer going to assume that that is a quadratic. And so that's why uh, we learn that gradient descent. You can actually see, of course, it's the current iterate with a, a subtraction of a gradient image. And so that's just reflected by this uh, skip connection, this residual connection around this network. So we're just going to learn uh, what that regularization step needs to be. And then uh, we can view this as um, just maximizing a Poisson log likelihood with a constraint that it must not go too far from that smoothed update. So this is the well-known uh, proximity operator. And so that whole expression is just uh, maximized by the same process that I've been showing previously, where we just have this intermediate smoothed image, the data fidelity based update, fuse them together in this uh, single update step, which is just, um, just maximizing that expression. And of course, uh, because we're using surrogate functions here, it doesn't give us an end point. We have to keep iterating. Um, okay, and so here is that methodology demonstrated um, when trained for one unique uh, architecture for each module. So the same parameters shared across all updates, 77,000 parameters trained from 35 patients. Here's the high quality reference data, 30 minutes. And then FBSCMNet delivers this result on the right hand side. Um, from just two minutes of data, obviously superior to the standard EM reconstruction. Uh, there are problems with FBSEM net though. Uh, if you want to train up many such modules, such as 60 updates typically used clinically, then you're really going to need about 200 gigabytes of memory to store all the feature maps and all the gradients for all that back propagation during the training um, stage. 
And so what that means is that in practice, one often uses fewer uh, modules, uh, CNNs, than one has updates that were used to generate the targets. And so that's not ideal. It means your CNN will end up being more of a, an acceleration method as well as a regularizer, whereas we want it to just be a pure regularizer. So what we see also though, is that uh, we don't have any control over the intermediate updates. And that means that uh, a lot of the regularization and even some of the reconstruction compensation is done in the last module. So the proposed solution that we pr just published uh, earlier this year is to use iteration dependent targets and iteration dependent loss functions which i'll show you in a moment and to make the training practical uh, we train each model um, in turn sequentially without back propagating through the entire sequence of modules and updates so here is a, another view of that fbscm net arch architecture normally it's the same module sorry same architecture same cnn for all modules and here is that endpoint mean square error loss function so the difference that we've introduced uh, further is to now do iteration dependent targets and loss functions and therefore to also train up unique architectures, unique sets of parameters for each module. Um, here is the bias variance performance of that methodology. So first of all, low count OSCM here, high count data here, and the deep learned methods are taking us from effectively that curve towards the curve that we want to see on that low um, low noise set of images and if we look at the deep learned methods we've just compared various implementations of FBSCM net crucially though including that sequential training method that I just talked about and that sits nicely um, on the lower bound of this collection of deep learned methods and it's also compared to the iterative neural network from TMI um, but because it's memory efficient that means we can now go on to 120 or 180 updates um, in a feasible way in the training process. So that allows us to get to lower levels of bias compared to the other deep learned methodologies. Okay, so uh, synergistic uh, deep learned reconstruction. Why do we want to do this? Well, uh, we often want to use um, common information between MR and PET to try and help out for undersampled MR, possibly, but mainly really to help out with low count uh, PET data. Um, if you just use MR information to guide a low count PET, uh, reconstruction you can be at risk of compromising unique regions that are in the pet data and so we can see MR guided MAP EM um, can actually cause smearing and, and loss of information in pet unique regions so to try and um, do a synergistic version of um, reconstruction here what we now do is actually take first of all an unrolled pet um, reconstruction then an unrolled MR reconstruction and then we just feed in uh, information from each modality to help in the regularizer of the other modality. So with conventional um, MR guided PET, that would be using the endpoint MR, which will have components that maybe don't correspond at all to the PET. It would take that and guide this, whereas here, we're allowing many different um, iterates of the MR before all the details have been sorted out here to feed in and regularize uh, the PET and vice versa. Um, furthermore, because we can't be sure about which um, iteration will help in the regularization of the other modality, we then allow all iterations uh, that are feasible um, to feed into the regularization uh, module uh, for the opposite modality. And furthermore, uh, we also allow self-guidance of a given modality as well. So that means all the previous PET iterates can inform the regularization of the later um, iterates and likewise for the MR um, and then again we're using iteration dependent targets and loss functions for training up this dense synergistic network so there again is a repeat of the problem I showed earlier where you've got loss of um, uptake in that pet unique region uh, with the synergistic methods the deep learned synergistic methods are shown here and basically we do better in that region of unique information in the PET whilst retaining a lot of the benefits in the global area of the brain. Okay, I'll just finish uh, with deep learning prediction of clinical image quality assessments. Here we just uh, trained up um, a CNN here uh, based on a clinician uh, reading off, um, giving us um, um, assessments of image quality for a collection of FDG uh, brain scans uh, for dementia patients. And uh, what we see here, the CNN has successfully uh, trained up uh, to predict global quality rating, pattern recognition, and diagnostic confidence. 
And we can see here for low, mid and high dose levels, uh, the predictions of image quality. And um, in short, it does do a fairly good job when we start also benefiting from pre-training and a different architecture of EGG backbone. We can see we get good agreement um, with um, the clinician. Okay, so there's my summary, just, um, just direct uh, deep learned reconstruction for single photon imaging, unrolled methods for PET and synergistic reconstruction, and then a quick uh, look at prediction of in clinical image quality assessment. Thanks for listening.